All right. Welcome, everyone, to uh, Investing 101, our first session of the year. We're very excited that you're joining us. So many of you, we've literally got 76 people right now, which is uh, very exciting. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm David Dweck, the president of uh, Investment Society at UAB this year, and I'm delighted that you're all joining us this evening. Um, I'm a fourth year student. I study history and Spanish, and I'm interested in investment, which you will see as we progress through the talk and throughout the evening. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pass you over to our co-host now, Henry. He will give a little introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you all for the amazing turnout tonight. Uh, David and I and the rest of the committee were really, really happy because we've put a lot of effort into these events and we finally started up our own kind of investing tutorial session. So it's great to see so many of you here and we really hope you enjoy what we've got in store tonight. Um, yes, yeah, so as David said, I'm Henry, I'm 30 Recon. Uh, I have a passion for investing and I enjoy teaching people as well. Uh, so that's why I really wanted to go ahead and lead this session. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my background later after David's done his slides, but I'll pass you back to David for a, a proper introduction and then we're gonna get on with the session. Right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Put a, a thumbs up or a Henry, can yep. you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Would you mind how's, going over? How's my internet, David? Is it smooth? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, perfect. The slide so we can. Uh... Yep. Great. Okay. So this is the agenda of the evening. Um, four points. We're going to get started with the main session very quickly, but I'm going to talk very, very briefly about the Investment Society. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen our events on social media, have attended our events. We've been doing a lot this year and we now have 400 members, which is incredible considering we started at zero in August and it's a relatively new society. So thank you for your support with that. We've got loads of offerings. This is the start and probably the most exciting thing that we run is these investing one-on-one -on -one sessions for anyone, regardless of you know whether you're a humanities student or a, or a finance student, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, we're, we're growing and we're really glad that you're part of that journey. Um, Henry, the next slide, please. And the next one after that. <laughs> okay, as I mentioned before, um, I'm a final year student and I don't study economics. I don't study money, banking, and finance. I study history and Spanish. Um, and you might be wondering, I had this question years ago, can I invest? Is investing for me? And the answer is absolutely yes. You don't need to study a financial degree to get into the financial world. It is a myth and it has been debunked. Um, I've got friends who are on my course that have got jobs, um, grad scheme, successful grad scheme applications to, to major banks. So you don't need to be a finance student and you're still going to learn a lot. You're going to learn new skills and nothing that we teach you is going to be too advanced. Secondly, as I said, it's not, it's not too difficult for anyone. It's not too mathematical. Um, just stay with us and we'll teach you. Um, the third point here, you might be wondering is how can I invest if I'm a student? Henry is going to go through that because you really don't need to have a lot of starting money, generally speaking, to be able to see some gains and even to learn the basic skills. And finally, um, Henry, if you can go on to the next slide, you might also be wondering how I got from here, no financial experience, uh, a non-finance student to here on the next slide with quite significant experience in a very short space of time within the financial world and as president of the investment society and the trick is to just immerse yourself as you're going to do this evening you're going to learn um which is great and we are so thankful that 84 of you are here this evening so very very quickly if you're not a finance student don't worry you're going to learn you're going to be great um henry next slide and there are four quick ways that i really recommend to help you alongside this course which is number one, the Student Investor. The Student Investor is our society's blog. Uh, it's uobinvest.org and it's free to subscribe to. We post articles three times a week and they will really help improve your commercial awareness, which is critical for job applications, just for knowing more about the world and for getting into investing in finance. So definitely check that out. Subscribe right now, it's free. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, secondly is the Financial Times. If you're a student, especially at University of Birmingham, Many students don't know this, but you actually get a free subscription uh, to the Financial Times. And again, that is a fantastic resource. Thirdly, Finimize is an app. Um, it's a lot more accessible for beginners, uh, such as presumably many of you here. And it basically gives you an update every single day with two very easy headlines to understand. And finally, a great way to improve your commercial awareness and get started is through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably my favorite social media app, as, as sad as that might be right now. 
but it's fantastic for leveraging your way to making new connections within the financial world. Even if you don't want to go into finance, just to, to speak to new people in the industry you do want to go into and um, basically put your name out there. So without further ado, I hope that that was helpful. Just so if you are a non-finance student, you know that you're in the same boat as everyone else. So don't worry. And uh, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Henry. So Henry, feel free to get started. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, right. Thanks for that introduction, David. Firstly, just wanted to ask, what can everybody see on my screen? Can they see, they can see the slides, right, David? Can you see yourself or can you see me? Because I've got you in the top right corner. I can see, I can see your slide as the main thing and then everyone down the side. You can see everyone down the side. Okay, that's a matter of personal preference then. There's like little toggle things right. of who you can see on the side, but you can minimize that to the person speaking and then people just should be able to see me, I think. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Feel free okay. to get started when you want. Awesome. Right. So very brief introduction. I copied David's very eloquent style um, through LinkedIn. Uh, this is just kind of my background. My name's Henry, third year econ student. Uh, I've enjoyed investing for a few years now, um, kind of got into it when I was back at school. Uh, and I've done some financial experience in both on kind of the buy side, which means investment management firms, people that manage others' money and try to make a return. And I've also done some stuff in banks. I've done kind of researching stocks at banks. Uh, I've also done sales and trading. I was in commodities, which basically meant I was trading uh, things like wheat, corn. Uh, it was basically being a weatherman. It was kind of fun experience. But yeah, I mean, that's me. At the moment, I'm a student and kind of running my portfolio on the side. Uh, so that's the introduction. Before we start, a few things. I've been designed this presentation to be interactive. Everything's great when it's interactive, keeps everybody on their toes uh, and keeps everyone engaged, right? You don't want me talking the whole time. You want to make sure that you can actively get something out of it as well as passively. Uh, second thing, David mentioned studying economics as a non-finance student. I am technically a finance student. I study economics. I learned basically none of this from my degree. That's a very, very, very clear point. Like David and I get it all the time. People are like, oh, I can't go into investing. I don't study economics. It's absolute bollocks. It really is. Like, honestly, most of this is comes from my own reading, my own knowledge, and the, experience, the financial experience that I got. Um, you do not need an economics degree to get this stuff. And most of it is all very academic and non-applicable. Um, Disclaimer, the Investment Society in Herrigar and Roberts takes no responsibility for any third party decisions, nor does any material constitute as financial advice. When investing, the value of your investment may go down as well as up and you may get back less than you invest. I just have to say that in case anybody fancies suing me. Uh, and number four, yeah, so if anybody with investing experience finds this too easy, don't be scared to leave. I, I, it is an engaging presentation even for people with ex investing experience, but if you do want to leave uh, because it's so easy, come back at 7.30, I've got a stock pitch. And then we're going to discuss all the crazy shit that happened in the market today, which is going to be fun. Uh, and feel free to get in touch. Like I'll hammer this point home at the end, but my name's Henry Gordon Roberts. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me or any of the committee about kind of what you want to see in this session, feedback. Um, basically, you know, we made this session for you guys and we're doing the same with subsequent sessions and we'd like to see what you guys think and where we can improve. Okay, so... Investing is hard work. It's very hard work. It's like playing Monopoly, but you're on speed, right? And when something's very hard work, you have to put in a lot of effort. In order to produce effort, you have to be motivated. So where better to start than to get people motivated? So what is exciting about investing? Let's all just take a few seconds to think about it, because I had a lot of time to think about this. Um, and there are many reasons, but I came up with the top three. Um, here's number one time as young intelligent people time is our greatest asset so one massive thing that motivates about me with investing as with most skill sets is that we're young you know we're young we have the time to learn we've got all the resources to learn uh, and that's a very very powerful thing here's albert einstein he once said allegedly urban myth not confirmed if true or not what is the most powerful force in the universe um, does anybody know what he said and what he pondered? You, you can either turn your mic on or go in the chat if anyone knows what he allegedly said. Compound interest. Compound interest, exactly, Dan. 
Um, compound interest. So the key idea with compound interest is the money, the interest you make on your money becomes a part of your new pile of money. And then when interest goes on that money, that new interest is earning money on itself. That's completely different from simple interest, where if you have an amount in the bank, you would just get the same amount again and again and again and again, despite that return. The example I've used, investment on $1,000, that would be 5% annually at $50 a year, every year, even if you reinvested that $50. So to show you mathematically how this works, let's say you're a 20 year old student, you have 1000 pounds, an investment offers you 10% return a year, every year until you retire at 65. This is not an unrealistic scenario for most of us. Most of us are around 20 years old, you know, maybe a few of us have got a thousand pounds we've set aside long-term savings that we can go ahead and invest. And with a good bit of skill set, we could earn 10% a year. That's roughly the return, the long-term return of the market. Oh, on the simple interest, here we go. You're getting paid 10% a year on 1,000 pounds, 45 times. So you get 450 quid from that, plus the 1,000 is 4,500. But with compound interest, the money builds on itself. So do you see the difference in return here? 4,500 on simple interest compared to 73,000 on compound interest. That is one hell of a powerful force. And it only takes a little bit percentage increase of the return or the number of years to this, for this number to increase drastically even more. So what does this mean in practice in the context of investing? Um, it basically means that when you invest, if you save that money and you reinvest it into other stocks, your money will compound on itself and you'll build wealth much, much faster than somebody that spends every penny on, you know, beer or whatever we'd spend our money on. Um, it makes big differences over time. As much as you can save and reinvest, that is how you compound your way to wealth. And we're just lucky that we are still young and we have the time to do that. Uh, so that was the first reason, I believe. Yes. Does anyone have any questions on that? No? We all good? All good, mate. Awesome. Right. I will, unless anyone's got anything burning, I'm happy to do it at the end. Um, but yeah, if anyone's got anything kind of coming up, I will pause every five slides and just see if anyone's with me. Honestly, don't be scared to speak up if you if I need to go into anything in more detail because I want everybody to be up to speed. That's the uh, yeah, that's how these uh, investing order one sessions are meant to be designed. Right, also, number two. Very quickly, Henry, feel free. Anyone, if uh, if you've got a question, just put it in the chat. You can type it to everyone or type it to me, and uh, I'll monitor it. So make sure that it gets read out to Henry at some point. Whew, I've got a sore throat already. Mm. Right, number two. Investing is meritocracy. This is one of my favorites. Like investing rewards you. It's one of those hobbies that rewards you. Hobbies. It's one of those things that rewards you. The smarter you are, the harder you work, the more dedication you put in, the higher your returns are going to be over time and the better you're going to do. A lot of people are in the unfortunate situation where they're tied to an employer uh, and no matter how hard they work or how much they slack, um, yeah, they earn a fixed amount. One of my best mates has just gone off to be an estate agent. Uh, he basically earns all his money on commission from selling properties. And he loves that because the harder he works, the more money he makes. Some people are, are in that position, but a lot of people, particularly people in the public sector, are not. Uh, but investing gives you the opportunity to take the incentive. If you're willing to work hard and go for it, you can reward yourself by earning higher returns. Right. And number three investing is opportunity. This is probably my favorite. I saved my favorite for the last one. Um, okay, here's another question. Does anybody know roughly how many stocks are publicly traded in the US market? So that'd be on the New York Stock Exchange. Roughly. We're getting a, a lot, loads in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Anything more specific? Too many. Too many. No, I mean, got, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we got <laughs> 30,000, 600, 5,000, 10K. Any? Go on, Henry. All right. Someone you guys... DM'd me 3,600. Uh, so credit to James if that's right. Interesting. 
Okay, so as far as as far as my research took me, it's about four thousand five hundred. So most of you are pretty close because you know, the average person on the street might say a hundred or a million. So yeah, most people were pretty close. Over it's over four thousand one hundred five hundred. Uh, but the point is that is in one country, in one asset class. The US used to make up most of the stock exchange. Now it's about 45%. By 2030, it's projected to be 40% as, um, as China and India get the kind of infrastructure to, to add more public companies to their stock exchanges. And that's one asset class as well. The debt market is even bigger than the stock market. And okay, in terms of the second question was, how many investments are sufficient for a diversified portfolio? I won't ask you guys this question because it's largely subjective, hence the big range here. But the answer is usually somewhere between six and 50. If you're a very ballsy individual investor, you might think six is okay. If you're, very, if you're like a pension fund who wants really diversification, uh, 50 might be the answer. But the point is there's tens of thousands of investments and you, you do not need more than 25 as an individual investor to be sufficiently diversified. What does this mean? It means you have the ultimate power of fuck you. Um, this is an amazing thing with investing. It really is because in many professions, you know, if you're a, if you're a doctor, you, you'll have to see every patient. If you're a lawyer, you have to take on every case. Me as an investor, 99% of investments, I can go fuck you. Fuck you, you're not making enough money. Fuck you, your dividend yield is not high enough. You know, fuck you, your industry is in, sector, in sectoral decline. Um, you can, yeah, you can effectively afford to forget about 99% of the bullshit investments and focus on the 1% that's actually going to make you great returns. This power of abundance is really phenomenal in investing and it really does give you the power that you wouldn't get in a lot of other professions. Um, this is another big one. Uh, it goes along to a wider point, but investing has been democratized. So this is Wall Street in 1929, kind of at the, the height of the bubble before the crash, this picture was taken. Um, and back then, you know, imagine trying to trade stocks in 1929. God, imagine, you know, you, you have bits of paper around and you take the bit of paper to the bank and then there's a queue, 400 people all in hats to the bank. Um, and you can't, you know, I can look at financial statements on the internet, click of a button, boom, like that. I could not imagine investing in 1929. It was crazy. It was also a rich man's game, by the way. Um, this is the reality, 2020, you know, we have all our resources at our fingertips. Um, investment fees have gone down. You know, the average person can set up a brokerage account in a matter of minutes. Um, and the whole thing has been completely democratized and it allows driven, intelligent people to capitalize on the opportunity. Like that's what I love about investing. Um, okay, right. You're going to get the naysayers as well. Um, I know many people like that. They'll say, but, but, but investing is risky or investing is g -g -g gambling. And I mean, sure, that's true to an extent if you go in and blindly pick stocks, you know, that is true. Uh, but for somebody who knows what they're doing, this is 180 away from gambling. You know, there's a big difference between investing in a, in, a, in a stock which is backed by a company with given earnings and it produces stuff for the economy versus going to Vegas and say, I think that's red or I think that's going to go on black. Um, so, yeah, that's the point. It's true if you haven't put any effort into it, uh, as is the same is true with anything. Um, but the majority of people, they're very naive when it comes to the stock market. If you decide you're going to go and be an investor, be prepared to at least get some hate because people just think you have some gambling addiction. Um, and most people don't actually understand that stocks are tied to financial markets, that are tied to businesses, that are tied to real people and real labor and real goods and the underlying economy. Yeah, and this, this goes a bit into philosophy, but you have to think, I mean, what is really riskier in reality? You know, go and dedicating your life to a whole job, learning a skill set, dependent on someone else for work, where the labor market may or may not demand that work. And you might have some money in the bank earning any interest, um, but you don't really, you're not really in control of your financial situation. You don't understand where your money's going or what the bank's doing with your money or where the interest rates are going to go. Or you can learn to invest and learn to look after your money. And then you can get exposure across the whole economy, across opportunities all over the economy. It's a skill set that allows you to branch into every other skill set in the world. Uh, and from there, you can build your self-sufficiency and you're on the way to financial freedom. You know, you really have to think which one of these two is riskier. Um, I certainly know what I would choose. 
Uh, so yeah, here's some evidence. This is my return in my UK portfolio. Um, I've compared it against the FTSE All Share, which is basically just a conglomerate of all of the UK companies. Uh, that's basically what it is. Um, yeah, so as you can see, by the way, these big lines, that, that is not something weird happening with the portfolio. That's when I just changed the level of capital in my account. Uh, but as you can see, I was pretty much following the main market index, but in 2020, I've done quite well. Both of these percentages, they're going to be much, much higher because of what happened today. My portfolio has roughly gone up with the market. Um, but yeah, it's just a point that individual people like me, you can beat the index if you work hard. Uh, you can beat Wall Street. You know, you don't have to be some 65 year old genius in order to do this. Um, yeah. And in terms of comparing yourself against the index, this is an important thing to do, right? Because if I was down here making 15%, and the index was making 26%, I could have put my money in the index, right? And made 26% and then done nothing else. Like I could have, that opportunity cost is huge. I could have gone and learned how to become a professional football player, for example. Uh, so that is important. It's important as an individual investor to, in the long run, for you to be able to beat the relevant index by a long amount. Um, here's the same thing for the US. Uh, this has a much shorter time horizon just because back over here, I kind of, there was a lot of things with coronavirus and everything was in cash and there weren't, there wasn't really enough stocks to call it a diversified portfolio. But since COVID, I kind of sorted my portfolio out a bit. Um, and my, my US portfolio has done pretty well compared to the S&P. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all to say on that. I mean, you can go ahead and you can, you can invest in stocks and don't worry if you weren't beating the index right away. I'm sure there were many points back here where I was losing to the index, um, but that's fine. If, if, it, if it helps you to learn, you know, when you're investing, no one's gonna be able to do it right away. And even expert investors have periods of years and years when they're not beating the index. But the point is over the long run, you want to be beating these indexes because otherwise, why just not put it on something like an index fund and go and have fun with your life, you know? Um, okay, here we go. Here's the other one. Did Henry, sorry, very quickly. You just had a question from yes. Karim. Yeah, carry on. Uh, Karim has just asked, "What's the percentage relative to?" I assume he's referring to your portfolio compared to the uh, the market indexes. But can you see Karim. the can you see the percentages? Can everyone see it? If there's people on the right of your screen, minimize them. No, I think I think he can see. I think he's just. I think maybe Kareem wants to know what your thirty-four percent return is in compared to what is the eighteen percent. But the eighteen percent oh, is okay. the US S and P five hundred index, which we'll talk about more about indexes coming up. Yeah. It that is basically just just for a, a very brief overview. That is basically the the weighted average. When I say weighted, higher companies get more weighting. Bigger companies get more weighting. It's the weighted average of the biggest five hundred stocks in America. So it gives you a pretty good idea of how the average stock is performing. So basically what this graph is saying is that I'm, I'm doing better than the average. I could go and sit on my ass and invest in the average and dedicate my time to something else. So when you beat the average, particularly by a significant margin, it shows that your time is worthwhile when you invest, basically. Is that all right, Karim? Um, I just have a small question, actually. Um, sure. So you have that eighteen percent on S and P five hundred, mm -hmm. but and that's in two thousand twenty. But S and P actually just went up like max. I don't know. It was like four percent. Yep. In the last six months. So um, I'm not really sure what that eighteen percent is. Wait, so are you saying the S&P went down over the last six months? Yep. And it's only yeah, returned... No, I said, I said it, it didn't go that much. It didn't go up 18%, I think. Sure. So the reason that this graph is showing that it's returned 18% is because it's actually missed out a lot of the downside from March and April. So obviously back in, back in May and June, it's starting from a lower point than it would have done back in March and April. Because if, if everyone could see my mouse... Everyone got scared of Corona back in February, March, and the market went all the way down like this. And in April, it was kind of trading around here. And then we got to May 
when my graph starts and then that's when you can see it kind of start to pick up again so that's why this 18 percent is higher than the past six month return because a six month return would also capture kind of the the april may early may time when this market was even lower sorry when it was even hot when it was higher when it was even higher than when it started in may does that make sense yeah no it makes sense i i, I just said that um so I get that, but it's, I'm just saying that it's not 18% at the moment. It's, um, I think it's less than that. It's like 10%. So that, that's why I asked, or even less than that. It's like seven, around seven anyway. Oh, it's, sure. Do you mean for what time horizon? For six months? Yes, since, um, since June. Let's have, a, let's have a look. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. It depends on when in June. There was a low where it, it is about 18%. It does, it does look, to me, so, it does look about right. Yeah, even 20. Yeah. For, if you look at the 25th of June, it's, it's 20. Yeah, Zach's just said also the 1st of June to today is 18%. So and like if it you look doesn't at, matter when you're looking at it. But. And if you look at the 19th of March, it's 57% essentially. So 18 isn't too surprising this year. 57, bloody Christ. You see? <laughs> 57, fucking Christ. Fucking crazy. Yeah, guys. Honestly, we could have been born 10,000 years ago. We could be running around foraging nuts and we get to watch the stock market go up 57%. Jesus Christ. Um, right, okay. Is that any other questions? Is that all good? I think, I think we're all good at the moment. Awesome. Are we, we've retained all our participants as well, David. Yeah, it's fantastic. 93 of you here tonight. So thank you very much. We, uh, that is sweet. Honestly, I did this two years ago and I had about eight. I didn't do this two years ago. I did a really shit presentation two years ago and I've got about eight. Um, scaling up. Scaling up. Anyway, next slide. This is John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in modern history. Unfortunately, he died. He died at age 98. He wanted to live to 100, but he didn't make it. Um, but it's impressive he lived to 98, considering all the work that he did. He was the richest man in modern history. Didn't come from wealth, but built his wealth. And, but the point is, he has this quote where he says, do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure? That's to see my dividends coming in. Uh, and I think that quote's a little bit sad because there should be things that give you more pleasure in life. But I, say, I get the point that he's making. So he, he got very excited when he sees his dividends coming in. What a dividend is is it's a payment that a company will give you when you own shares in their stock. So they're basically paying out the profits um, to shareholders. And Rockefeller, he made a lot of money in oil. He pretty much had a, a monopoly on Standard Oil where he controlled all the oil at one point, uh, railroads, other commodities he got involved in. Uh, and he knew the power of this passive income. He knew um, the power of getting paid these dividends. Once he set up and did the initial work, building the company, he understood that getting the passive income from a dividend builds your way to wealth. Um, next slide, I thought I would throw in my dividend return as well. Um, you can see that per month, it's a bit staggered. That's because most companies, they, they, tend, to do it all, they tend to do it all at similar times. Um, yeah, a lot of my companies did their Q3 in October, hence why I got October and July so high. Um, but if you look at the six month average, then you can kind of see what my dividend income is. Uh, and the reason that it's gone up so much is because I just keep reinvesting these dividends in the company. Um, and it allows me to, or if I have a, if I, if I have a stock that's appreciated in value, I'll sell it, I'll reinvest it in another stock. And that's what's allowed me to keep building my dividend income over time. Um, right. My good, my good old friend, Martin, who I almost said his last name, but I wasn't, is there any, any questions on the chat, David? Yeah, we just got one from George, which is what happens if you buy a stock the day before the dividend is uh, rolled out or announced? That's a very, very good question. That's a very good question. I mean, a lot of Wall Street, a lot of professional investors ask that question themselves. Uh, the, what happens basically is there is um, about three or four weeks before a dividend is paid out, there's something called an ex-dividend date. And you have to buy a stock before that ex-dividend date in order to qualify for the dividend. And what that does is it stops people buying the stock just to get the dividend the next day. 
that's basically what happens. Um, so it's quite clever. Yeah, good question. Uh, we've got another couple very quickly, if you've got time. Yep. Which is, firstly, do you reinvest all your dividend payments? And secondly, for someone with little knowledge, would you ever recommend just investing in an index fund instead of trying to beat the index with your own, I guess, uh, personalized bespoke portfolio? Good question. Right. That's a ver Okay. Two very good questions. The first one, yes, I try and reinvest every dividend I can. Um, sometimes they don't go straight back into the stock. It's kind of complicated, but if it's, a, if it's some foreign stock, I have to reinvest it in the company manually. Some of my stocks, the dividends get automatically reinvested in the company, which is great. And I don't even have to worry about it. But yeah, most of the time I'll reinvest them. Um, the second question, would you recommend somebody to put their money in an, in an index fund if they don't have a lot of money about investing? 100%, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it beating the index is a very hard thing to do. A uh, very, very hard thing to do. And it takes a lot of time and dedication. And great, you can put most of your money in an index fund uh, and still learn about investing with a demo account or with an account with a very small amount of money. Um, you know, if, uh, yeah, if you want, you can do 90% in a good index fund, maybe diversify even a bit more, and then just have 10% that you're playing around or just get a demo account until you have, hmm, I've been the index over the last six months. Maybe I could shift some of my capital from the index into my own portfolio. I think a, a key point of that, which you kind of raise is, firstly, you know, what are you looking for? Are you looking to make big money? Or, you know, how much time do you have to dedicate? If, you, if yep. you've got loads of time on your hands, you know, you can go <laughs> research your own stocks and build your own portfolio. But if, if you want to just kind of put your money there, sit there and invest in the index fund, which just to clarify is, you know, saying I'll put all my money into the top 100 companies in the UK or the top 500 in America, then, you know, that's another way of doing it. It's, it's very much personal preference and kind of what you can, what you can achieve with your time. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, good point, David. Oh, here we go. My good old friend, I nearly said his last name again. My good old friend, Martin. I don't want to reveal Martin's last name. But Ma Martin was just a bloke who I just, I went to a party and met a guy whose dad did investing. And I got talking to him and I said, look, can I, can I talk to your dad? Um, so I've been talking to Martin for a while. He's an investor. He's a tech nerd. He's a real tech nerd, a very smart guy. Uh, and he bought shares at Apple in 2000. Oh dear, he did. And he's made a 35,000% return. Um, and he's now rich and he's now, tra he's now moved all of his money into other stocks. So big on him. That just shows you, you know, again, he was a small individual investor like us, uh, went to uni, got a job at a software company, saw Apple was doing well, analyzed the stock prospects, put a bit of money into it um, and made thousands and thousands of, of percentage points on it. Um, yeah, it just goes to show that the opportunities are out there. Um, yeah, that was basically the point of that. And if you're skilled enough and brave enough to find the right kind of company, uh, then, your, then your returns could be absolutely extortionate. I guess ultimately that's what we're trying to teach you here. And over the next few weeks, next few months, this is exactly what you're going to learn. So uh, stay tuned. Sure. Uh, right. That, that, okay, this is just a recap of what we've been through. There are infinity of reasons to get people excited, but here are my top three. Time is our most important asset and compound interests our most powerful force. Again, disclaimer, no hard evidence Einstein said that. It's an urban legend, it might be true, but the principle still applies. Investing is meritocracy. If you're willing to work hard, you'll be rewarded. Investing is opportunity. Everything's been democratized. We're very lucky to live in 2020, incredibly lucky. Uh, incredibly lucky. Um, and yeah, the opportunities are just endless. And that is very exciting. If you've got the work ethic and you've got the intelligence, um, the world is your oyster. Absolutely. Um, okay, do we have any questions before we move on to the next part? We all good, David? Yeah, it, it seems that way. Cool, I think cool, cool. One, thing, one thing just to kind of reinforce and emphasize is that what henry's saying is from his personal opinion you know don't go listen to his presentation and then say right i'm putting all my money in this stock um no, don't do that <laughs> it's all uh it's the same as someone asked the question about trading a 212 in cfds you know we're, we're not saying put your money in this we're just simply teaching you the skills and resources um so then you can make your own investing decisions and hopefully make some money cool 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 uh oops 
let me just minimize that. Right. What makes a good investor? What makes a good investor? Here's Warren Buffett, good old Warren Buffett that have read, have read everything in his local library by 11 on investing. He was driven. Uh, and now he is, you know, he's been the richest man in the world. He was for the most of the 1990s. He had a bit of a competition with Bill Gates, who was actually good friends with kind of in the 2000s. But anyway, the point is, he's, he's, he's swum one who's come from the bottom and gone all the way up just from investing uh, under his kind of parent company, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, yeah, so I thought, what actually makes a good investor? Uh, because investing is not for everybody. Everybody can invest. Uh, but in my opinion, most people should do it with the aid of a wealth manager, unless you kind of feel like you fit the mold for investing. Um, I'd be lying if I said this was for everybody. And I think a lot of people on this chat to kind of find out if it's something for them and something they want to do. Uh, so there are two main things I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover kind of personality and temperament. Uh, and then I'm also going to cover, you know, how much kind of money you need to get started. Right. So here we go. Qualities. This is the most kind of important thing. Uh, no bullshit. You know, certain qualities are important with investing. Um, the bad investor ones are just kind of a, they're the opposite of everything that's good, basically. So patience, you know, you really have to be patient in these times. Um, particularly if you're a long-term investor like me, you're like, I, I owned a game design company. Uh, well, I still own it, actually. And uh, I knew, well, I had conviction it was a good investment. Uh, but it traded sideways for like two years, right? The graph was sideways, two years. And then and these annual reports were coming out great. And then about two weeks ago, one half-year report came out. Boom, investors reacted and it went up about 55%. Um, and if I wasn't patient in that regard and sold early and blown all of the conviction I had on that stock, then I wouldn't have made that money. You've also got to be very rational. Um, if you can't rationalize things well, this is probably not for you. Discipline is important, but discipline is important with everything. Uh, intelligence. Yeah, you have, to be you have to be quite smart to do this. Um, yeah, I, th I think, you know, some somebody with an IQ of, of around 100 should should probably kind of stay away from this stuff because it can get very complex. And when I say stay away from it, maybe go more towards a passive option or outsource it. But saying that you don't have to be a genius. And I think if you if you've joined this call and you can get into UOB, that's a kind of, you know, intelligence level you need. It's not something that, you know, it's not like you're curing cancer. You know, if you have a good quantitative ability, you can think logically and think thoroughly and have good work ethic. 100 percent. You can get started in this. Um, this is quite interesting. You have to be confident and humble at the same time. Uh, so, you know, you have to be confident with your winners, but if something doesn't go your way or you're wrong about something, you have to be very willing to change your opinion. Uh, and lastly, adaptable. Um, things change, you know, the market, well, the UK market went up, you know, how much did it go up in the end? I was too busy finalizing this presentation. Okay. It went up nearly 5% in the end. So nobody was expecting that. Nobody was expecting um, Pfizer to come out saying we've made progress on our drug. You have to be adaptable. And then bad investor, that's basically just the flip side of everything that we just talked about. Um, yeah, emotional, if you're too impulsive and makes rash decisions, if you're lazy, you're not going to get anywhere. If you're stubborn and you don't have that humility about you, you're not going to get anywhere with this. Uh, so those are the kind of general qualities you look for. Oh, dear, the Myers-Briggs test. I became... I became way too obsessed with this over lockdown. I studied it incessantly with a mate who lived with me. But anyway, the point of it is, go and take it if you want. It's a personality test. Um, if you come more towards the INTJ side of the scale, investing is more for you. Uh, if you go more towards the ESFP side of the scale, it's something that's probably not in your natural skill set. Um, yeah, kind of think Elon Musk, Justin Bieber. You know, you want to be more towards the Musk. Um, but yeah, it, that, that is that it's not the be all and end all, but it just kind of gives you a benchmark as the, the kind of people that tend to do well in investing. Okay. Do you need to be rich? Are you ready? The answer is no. Democratization. Demo it's 2020. You don't longer need to be rich. Honestly, in the 1920s, this was a rich man's game with, um, with Rothschild and Rockefeller and JP Morgan all sitting around the table with their shares. It's not like that anymore. You can set up a brokerage account in a matter of minutes. Um, you can get an annual report in a matter of minutes. Every, every company by law has to publish financial statements. They have to. It's, it's the law because they're investors of the investors of the general public. Um, the only thing I would say about money is you want to make sure you're not paying too high brokerage fees 
or taking on investments with high spreads. So for, an ex for example, what I mean by that, say for instance, you want to invest a hundred pounds in a stock um, and your brokerage is Hargreaves Lansdowne. Hargreaves Lansdowne charge a fixed amount per share, 11.95, I believe it is, unless inflation has pushed that up. Uh, but 11.95, if you're putting a hundred pounds on a stock, it's 11.95 a buy, 11.95 a sell, that's 13 pound 90 you're gonna pay in brokerage fees and you're investing a hundred pounds. So that's 13.9% already gone and scuppered. And you're gonna to have to make 13.9% to break even. Um, yeah, and you know, if you found an investment that makes 13.9%, that's really good on you. You know, why put that all to a brokerage account? So I'd just say, you don't need a lot of money to invest. Just be careful of the fees you're paying if you don't have much capital. What I would advise to people is if you're starting with a small amount of money, you want to go for brokerage fees, ISAs, with, who have kind of variable rates of, of brokerage. You know, I know that they're out there increasingly, but you don't want to be with a brokerage that has kind of like a high fixed cost uh, when you're trading. Henry, do you mind if I just put in there very quickly? Yeah, go on, mate. Yeah. Um, firstly, we're going to cover different brokerages, uh, different ways that you can actually invest your money online uh, in future sessions. So any questions about that will probably be next week uh, if we can. So we're going to leave that for now. Um, we've got a couple of questions if you're all right for time. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> the, uh, the first one is, is investing a full-time hobby as a uni student? How much time would you advise spending on a investing, dedicating time to that? uh less than me <laughs> oh god uh right okay for okay it, it obviously it varies like um it varies on how complicated you you make this to be it's investing is one of those things where it's like the more you know the more you don't know and back in first year of uni when i was kind of getting started with it i spent four or five hours a week on it uh and i would kind of um you know look at the p /E ratio you know, go read the top line of an annual report and think, oh, this industry is doing okay, and boom. And now, like, I'm doing complex financial modeling and it's taken up, like, 40, 50 hours a week. But the answer is as much as you want it to. Always put your studies first um, and put, you know, your social life and family first. Like, they're the most important thing, particularly for you guys. Job applications as well, particularly if you're going into a competitive industry um, when the unemployment rate is going to skyrocket. Uh, so, yeah, I would say... It, it honestly it's up to you um dedicate as much time as you want to it um and don't be scared to start a small portfolio with a small amount of money and put five hours a week on it or just open up a um a kind of a, a virtual fund uh, you know where you can kind of trade with fake money i think that's that's great you know investing is such a personal thing and some people can some people obviously do it as a full-time job and some people an hour an hour a week an hour a month it's uh yep. It's really, you know, the, the resource and time you've got at your uh, disposal. We've got another one, which is following on from the investor qualities you talked about, you know, desirable qualities in an investor. Yep. Would you say that the response to Pfizer today was impulsive or logical and rational? Before you answer that, you might just want to explain very quickly um, the whole Pfizer news and, and kind of what happened and its, its consequences for the market, just so everyone's on the same page. Sure. I love these questions, guys. I really love these questions. I like the fact they're coming as we go as well because it just makes everything more interactive. Yeah, so basically Pfizer, so Pfizer had been on my radar. The other company, which escapes my name, the German one, something tech, I, ha I hadn't even heard of, but I was aware that Pfizer were doing a deal with some, in my mind, I call it German tech company. Um, so basically, yeah, um, it was reported that they were getting much closer to getting their drugs approved. Um, yeah, for COVID, the, the COVID vaccine. Uh, so that's what's, go what's going on with Pfizer. Um, whether it was impulsive or not, I guess that depends on one, how well researched it was, and two, your time horizon. Uh, so I put in a market order for Pfizer this morning, about 12.30. Uh, but I had previous research on the company. I was looking to get some pharmaceutical exposure. Uh, and I knew, I, knew, I knew that was kind of on my horizon. I hadn't kind of made a decision between to go for Abby or to go for Pfizer. I think it could be impulsive if you didn't know what you're doing. If, you, if it was a very short-term trade um, and you didn't understand the technicals very well, that I would say that would be quite impulsive. If it was a short-term trade and you were a technical trader and you were, you were very, very confident about how the lines were going to go, not necessarily impulsive if you know what you're doing. For me as a long-term investor who doesn't really mind where that short-term line goes, is kind of using it as a, 
as a hedge if they do get the COVID vaccine and actually quite likes the long-term underlying business fundamentals of Pfizer. That's also not impulsive. But yeah, a lot of people could get caught out if they don't know what they're doing and they jump on the gun with Pfizer without either doing their fundamental research, their long-term research beforehand, or being very, very good at the technicals. 100%. I'm just going to add my, my own little opinion to that. Sure. Yeah, sure, man. Uh, you if, do that with all the questions, by the way, well, it, whichever ones you want to. I appreciate that. If you're a, a beginner starting out, which, I, as I said at the beginning, I assume most of you are, um, and you've just set up a trading 212 account or something like that on your phone, you don't really know what you're doing, and you see this big news headline flash up as a notification from BBC or whoever, it, it's, uh, it is risky just putting all your money in if you've not done research. Uh, we're going to cover research again in future, in future sessions. Um, but so much about investing is down to emotional control and kind of risk management. And so from a personal opinion, if you are a beginner doing that, it is, it is risky and probably unadvisable unless you have significant research to back it up. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said, man. Um, so that would be the answer. Um, okay. So yeah, right. I hope that motivated the fuck out of everybody. Um, now we're going to go on to a bit more, bit more of the technical side and give everyone a flavor of kind of what's to come. Does anyone have any more questions on motivations for investing or shall I invest before we start on this? We do have one saying, do you always have to pay fees? But again, we'll cover that in a future, a future brokerage session and different options for actually trading practic uh, in practice. Sure. practice. Yeah. That, that's a very, it's not a comp well, it's a complex question in the sense that there's a lot of variation. The short answer is, Oh, geez. The short answer is almost, but there's a lot of variance in the amount of fees you have to pay, depending on the brokerage. Great. Right. Let's just, uh, just, just a quick thing. We've got about 10 minutes, Henry, if that's all right. Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to stay longer, but... I don't think that is all right. Let, I think we should just keep plowing on. Do it. At least this isn't a 10-minute presentation and everyone's bored out their brains, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah, well, let's hope. I mean, the participants have only ever gone up. And uh, yeah, but let's carry on. Let's see how everyone feels after the second half. Here we go. Right. You guys can do this bit. Types of asset classes. Give me some asset classes, everyone. Oh, shit. We got in the comments, stocks, bonds, options from Manas. Yep. Metals, commodities, real estate, private yep. equity, futures, some good stuff in there. There's more that are even on the slides. Yeah, a lot of those would come under the, and many more. Um, I think we should, we should do a session on all that sexy stuff uh, at some point. Um, the five that I wanted to cover today, kind of the five most common, stocks, bonds commodities currency and real estate um stocks is the main thing that kind of i do uh in my investment life but other things always come into play so for example when i'm valuing a company i need to look at their bonds to help me work out something called a discount rate which i'll explain another time but that will kind of help me value the company some of the companies that i invest in are, are commodity companies you know and they're they're backed by by things like gold and oil i'll, I'll explain that uh, currency is also a big one. A lot of my money is in the US markets. Um, so basically what, what that means is that if the, if the dollar goes down, it's very cheap for me to invest. Um, but my existing investments actually lose their value because I spend my money and pay my electricity bills in pounds. Um, but I, on the other hand, if the, if the dollar goes up, it's expensive for me to buy more American shares, but the shares that I've already got are worth more real value to me. Uh, because I can sell them. And because the pound's weaker, the dollar will buy me more pounds. Um, and then there's real estate, which is basically the American and sexy way to say houses or what's the, what's the British estate? I don't know. Estate. Is? Yeah. Anyway, property. Um, property. Yes, this is Jeff when he still had hair. So Jeff, Jeff had some high level job in the 1990s. I can't remember what he did. Maybe he was venture capital or some he was something along those lines. He was very corporate, high level consultant or something like that. And Jeff got a bit bored um, and he went on a road trip across the United States, basically in his dirty old car. And he decided he was gonna move in with his parents in his garage and start selling books. 
in the 1990s because Jeff was an avid reader, as are most people that are very successful. So Jeff starts a company and the company starts to do quite well and Jeff needs some money. So what does he do? Jeff needs some money for his business. He wants to take his business to the next level. Uh, so Jeff has got two options. Um, he can basically borrow, you know, as we all do to go to uni or to buy a house to leverage our position. Um, or he can effectively sell a stake in his business in the form of equity. That's similar to what you see on Dragon's Den, you know, where someone comes in and they're like, hi, I'm selling Sun Lounges and I'll give you 10% equity for 100 grand in the business. That's basically what that is. Uh, and if it's debt, he'll issue bonds. If it's equity, he'll issue shares or stock. Um, stocks, shares, equities, they're all pretty much synonymous with each other. Okay, so more on stocks. They're the main investment vehicle we're going to be talking about. Uh, that's what most of my skill set is on. Or as I mentioned, the other ones are all important. Uh, but that's the main one we'll talk about. Stocks are ownership in a company. So any public company, anyone can go and buy a small piece and they legally own that company, legally. Um, it's pretty cool, right? So 2018, Facebook had this Q2 result that the market thought was really bad. I didn't think it was that bad. I bought the shares and I bought, and I technically owned 0.0000004% of Facebook, which was quite cool. Um, even though at the time that was a tiny amount, I thought it was still cool that I had, yeah, a little share in the app that I used every day. Um, so stock prices, you see, they're very volatile and they fluctuate based on the supply and demand. Uh, you know, if people, a lot of people want that stock, the demand goes up and hence the price goes up. Uh, stock, you know, everyone doesn't want the stock, they'll all sell. The supply goes up and therefore the price goes down. Uh, is everybody with me? Is everyone good? Cool, cool. Is my internet? Yeah, everyone, everyone seems like they're, uh, they're on board, which is great. Awesome, man. Is my internet still good? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Cool. Right, here we go. It's the index, the index a lot of people were asking about earlier. So the FTSE 100, that's just an aggregate of all of the top 100 companies in the UK. Um, FTSE stands for Financial Times Stock Exchange, basically. Um, and it's, it's headquartered in London. Um, and this is a, it's what's called a capitalization weighted index, which means the, the biggest companies in the, in the index, um, they have more of a weighting on this overall price. They, it used to be people like Royal Dutch Shell and British American Tobacco, but both of them have been a bit fucked recently. I think it's people like Unilever and AstraZeneca that are at the top of the chain at the moment. Um, Glaxo, maybe Glaxo is close to the top. Um, anyway, yeah, so as you can see, this is kind of quite heavily tied to what's going on in the, in the economy. So we had a very good economy in the 1990s in the UK, and then there was kind of this massive stock market bubble and everything crashed in 2000. And then we had geopolitical nightmare with the World Trade Centers getting blown up and then, um, you know, us going into war within Iraq and Afghanistan, and then everything was okay, and the housing market was booming, and then everyone got very greedy, and people were lending out mortgages, and they weren't meant to be lended out on, and then the everything crashed because everything was so interconnected because Reagan and Thatcher liberalized everything. That's besides the point. Anyway, this is this is an index. That's what it is, and it's an aggregate of the top 100 companies in the in the UK. How to make money in stocks? This is what everyone came for. This is the most important slide. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make money in stocks, but two main ways. Number one, income in the form of dividends. Dividends are the profits that companies pay out to their shareholders, as I mentioned. Um, the second one is capital gains. That's where the price of the stock increases and you're able to sell your shares for more than you bought them for. Here's an example. I thought I'd use Coca-Cola, a company that everybody knows. Um, here you can see it's dividends. It's a, it's a pretty reputable dividend paying company. They've been increasing. So what this means is you buy the stock back in 2016, you'll be paid out 35 cents every quarter or every three months. And then they go, oh, our company's doing well. Let's raise it to 37. Let's raise it to 39. Um, so that's kind of how dividends work. And you, you get them paid out. As long as you own the company, you'll get them paid out straight to your brokerage account. And here's the capital gains. The price of Coca-Cola goes up and you're able to sell it for more than you bought it for. That's basically what that is. Bonds, here we go, bonds. There are many types of bonds, but again, I've simplified this. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna ask any questions on what I've just mentioned.
no questions in the chat. I think one thing maybe to mention, if you're happy to, is just, you know, how companies kind of form the FTSE 100 and how they can drop out, you know. Uh, oh, okay, maybe, sure. I thought it'd be quite interesting. Yeah, so basically, yeah, I don't, yeah, the tech, there's a weird technical process for that. I, I don't know the ins and outs of a technical process, but basically I, I said it was a capitalization weighted index. And what I meant by that is that the top 100 companies in this index, they, they're, they get into it by having the largest market cap. The mar a market cap of a stock is basically the share price of the stock multiplied by the number of shares. That's basically what it is. It gives you the total market cap of the company. Uh, so they can move up the market cap ranking by either increasing the price, well, by the share prices going up, determined by supply and demand, or by increasing the number of shares, the number of common shares. Um, yeah, is there anything you wanted to add to that, David? No, just that, you know, I think, I think it's a quarterly thing or maybe biannually that if uh, in small indexes within the UK, so for example, the FTSE 250, which is the biggest 250 companies in the UK, if some of the it's, biggest it's, ones it's there... Not, it's, it's, one, it's 101 to 350. Right, okay. Yeah. If, some of the, if some of the companies in the small indexes have a, end up having a larger market cap than the smallest ones in the biggest index, they can replace them. I think it's, is it biannually or quarterly? Good question. I've got no idea. I even had a hunch it might have been monthly, but I've, I don't know. Okay, either, either way, a company isn't necessarily safe in the FTSE 100. It can drop out if it, if it share price plummets and you know other companies in small indexes do better. Yep. I might just add a really interesting point. One thing I often like to do is I like to look at, I don't do this so much for the UK, but I do it for America. So America has the equivalent of this but it's 500. And I like to look at companies that are growing between 500 and 600. Because once they get into 500, many more analysts start covering them. Uh, and that's when, it, that's when their exposure happens. You know, professional Wall Street analysts research them. Uh, they're able to buy up these companies. There's many complicated things. The, the amount of money that they have means that these stocks are something called liquid enough. They're actually able to buy and sell these shares. Anyway, that, that's a good point. Um, and you'll find that often... Companies that are kind of 101 to 120 in the in the FTSE, if they're growing pretty quickly and they're heading towards the 50 FTSE 100, they usually get a massive boost when they actually get into the FTSE 100. Okay, bonds. Um, bonds again. The, the idea is very simple, but there's many kinds of bonds. Uh, corporate and gov. Sorry, corporate and government. Yeah. So those are the two I'm going to go through. Basically, as I said in the Jeff Bezos example, bonds are a loan. If you purchase a bond, what you're actually doing is you're loaning your money out to somebody, either a company or a government, uh, and they'll give you interest on that money. The interest is called uh, a coupon payment. Uh, you'll get a load of those, usually annually or biannually. Um, maybe some do quarterly, but it's most either once or twice a year. And then you receive your original uh, money back at the end. They're similar to dividends, except these coupon payments are fixed. Uh, and the reason that you get variance on the interest rates is that obviously some borrowers are much riskier than others. Um, you'll see, I'm, I might just skip forward a bit actually. Um, yeah, you'll see the, for example, the US government, these are the yields on the US government at the moment, the, the treasury, um, the treasury bonds, which, which are issued by a central bank on behalf of the US government, they're very low because the, uh, the, the central bank can just print money whenever it wants. Uh, which basically makes these bonds completely and utterly safe. The US will never default on them. But if you have another company like American Airlines, for example, uh, who have been in a lot of debt even before this and are now really struggling to make money um, because no one's flying because of COVID, uh, their, yield, their, their, their yield on the bond is much, much higher because their risk of not paying it back is much, much higher. Uh, so that's basically the technicalities of what I just explained. You have your initial, um, you have your initial amount that you pay out. You lose that amount of money, then you get all of these coupon payments back, uh, and then at the end you'll get your original investment back. Uh, so that's basically how it works. What's happening with bonds? You don't you don't hear a lot of people talk about bonds at the moment. I was pre it's pretty different. It, it used to be people used to talk about bonds much more, but the reason you don't hear any of us talking about them and the reason why stocks are, are sexy is because the interest rates are so low you know the interest rate has gone down and down and down and down um and there's not really 
that much value in, in bonds at the moment. We have a very, without getting too into it, we have a very inflated bonds market at the moment, meaning the prices of bonds are ridiculously high. And what actually happens is when the interest rates go down, the prices of the bonds that are already in the market, they go up. Because the new bonds have been issued at, at much lower interest rates, the bonds with the higher interest rates become very valuable. And because they're valuable, people want to buy them and then their price goes up. So yeah, all of this means in layman's terms that bond prices are very high with very low yields. Uh, and interestingly, that key point links into my Alpha Room thesis that I'm doing right after this session. If anybody's interested, it's on a company that will do very well, in my opinion, because of what's happening here. Uh, those are the yields on the treasury. I went through that. You, you see that it, the yields are much higher for, for the long term. Does anybody know why that is? Because of increased risk. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so what you've got going on here is if it's one, if it's one month, you know, there's not much opportunity cost. So there's not much that could happen in one month that would be dangerous. But over 10 years, you know, inflation could take off in 10 years and erode the value of your bond. Um, the opportunity cost, you know, there, there's just, there's so much more that can happen in 10 years. And so people need a higher yield to be compensated for it. Um, so that's that. Oh yeah, also this is November. It's not, you know, 11th of, April, 11th of June. It's just, um, those are the American dates. Commodities, people talked about commodities when I asked about asset classes. Yeah, so basically commodities are anything tangible, gold, iron ore, soybeans, wheat, cattle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if anyone's asking how long this presentation has got left, I would say we'll be done in less than 10 minutes. Thank you for sticking around. I'm sorry it's run over, but hey, at least it's been a good presentation. Um, we hope. Yeah, it's, it's, nearly, it's nearly finished. Um, okay, so commodities. Yeah, so commodities are interesting. You can trade anything. Uh, as I mentioned, I did a bit of trading in kind of soybeans and wheat when I was at Citibank on the, on the sales desk. And I would kind of go in and I'd be a weatherman every morning because that's what determined the prices of these crops. And when there was a massive heat wave, the price of wheat would go up because there'd be massive droughts and people were worried, oh, we're going to be less wheat. There's going to get, be less wheat. Uh, so the existing wheat was more valuable and hence the price of wheat went up. Um, but yeah, so gold, I'll go through gold very quickly. Gold is a precious metal often seen as a safe haven. Um, that's why there's so much talk about it because it's, it's not that well correlated to, to stocks and bonds and people kind of rush to it in, in times of dismay. Uh, it's gone up a lot recently and it's kind of been in a rally since March when COVID took off, uh, except you see it go back down again when there's more positive sentiment. Um, and then oil, oil, well, shit, oil. Um, yeah, something really interesting has happened with oil. Does anyone, does anyone know why things have shifted so much with oil? Does anyone know what's going on? Well, for a fact, they went, the price, uh, the prices for the futures went negative at one yeah. point and it was due to the huge supply, but not a lot of demand. So people didn't want to take delivery of the oil basically exactly that that was a very interesting phenomenon I, I think it was around about early may when the price of oil actually went negative and basically what was happening there was people were saying the the demand for oil is so low you actually have to pay us to store this oil because it you know it costs a little bit to store barrels of oil right and that was a very interesting phenomenon um but what's have been happening with oil is the oil is usually purely a supply based, uh, the price is usually purely driven by supply because demand for oil is usually pretty stable, right? Um, I, I believe 70% of it is, um, is, tr is transportation, about 40% automotive, um, and then about 30% um, uh, oh jet fuel, which is propane and that. Um, so obviously what's happened is demand has collapsed. You know? So usually it's supply side, with, with OPEC, you know, getting all geopolitical and trying to change their supply around. Um, but now it's, it, the, the price of oil is, is mainly demand driven um, just because of the huge fluctuations in demand because, you know, none of us are flying and, and automotive um, use has gone down so much because of COVID. So that's an interesting thing to note there. Uh, and many oil companies are struggling. They're saying this is gonna catalyze renewable energy uh, and everything. 
Right, next session. Okay, foreign exchange, here we go. Uh, so most of you probably remember this from when you were younger and you went on holiday and it's like, oh, well, it's more expensive to, to go abroad or whatever. Like how much pocket money do we get when we go to the airport and exchange it? Yeah, this is basically very self-explanatory. It's, uh, it's, it's how much you can buy one currency relative to another. Um, so I just put up this graph with the, um, the UK and the US because I wanted to show you kind of what influences these currency pairs. People try and trade mainly based off macroeconomic news and technicals about what's influencing these, these currency prices. So for example, if you look at 20, yeah, late, very late 2014 when the Fed did that interest rate raise, what's going on in here is the Fe Federal Reserve raised the interest rate in the US. Basically, because you can now get a higher return on your, your, on your US dollars, the demand for US dollars went up. Um, the world is dominated by debt. Debt is the biggest global market. And in fact, 40% of global debt, probably more now after COVID, is denominated in US dollars. So interest rates go up. Everyone starts to basically suck the cock of US dollars. And as you can see, the US dollar rose to the pound. Um, here you've got, right after the interest rate cut, uh, a, a a pound could buy you $1.55 and right after the cut, it could buy you about 1.5. So the purchasing power went down. Uh, same thing. We had all this Brexit in about 2016, 2017, and everybody was like, Oh shit, the UK economy is going to get fucked because they might not be able to trade or whatever. And but basically everybody, everybody really feared the UK. You can see this, you can see Brexit on there. What's that? 148 to 133, something like that. So the purchasing power of the pound went down so much just because there was less capital inflow coming into the UK because people didn't have confidence in the UK market because Brexit happened. So that's basically what's happening with foreign exchange. Um, okay. Lastly, property. Property draws a lot of parallels to stocks. I'm sure you guys all know a bit about property. You know, you buy a house, house prices go up and you can sell. You can flip houses. A lot of people do that. They buy beaten down houses. They do their DIY magic and then sell them later on. Or they often buy houses and rent them out. Um, and it's the same as stocks. The two main ways to make money are from the capital gain increase in the value of the house or from the rental income. Right. Those are pretty much all the basics. There's two more points, two more slides. Uh, and then we can finish. A couple more questions and then five minute break. And then anybody who wants to stay for Alpha Room. Okay, first point, this was something that I almost didn't include. And then David was like, this is important. And I'm like, I was like, yes, David, this is important. Um, so yeah, this is what's in here. Active versus passive. This is a terminology that a lot of people who have been following the financial markets for a little bit of time might have heard and don't understand. It's basically, it, yeah, it, it says it in the name, active versus passive. Active is a hands-on approach where your money is actively managed by a professional. They're going, am I going in? Am I going out on the stock? Um, there's typically higher fees because obviously it, it, you know, it takes time to be able to manage a portfolio actively. An example of that would be a mutual fund. Uh, passively, on the other hand, that's where you initially set the investment up, uh, but it doesn't take a lot of management um, to do that uh, because you, you're not constantly worrying about which shares to add. So it makes it more cost effective as well. An example of that is an index fund. It just tracks the, the level of the index. And as you can see, passive funds have risen in recent years. Uh, we had a pretty stable stock market. Well, at least from 2011 to 2018, we had a pretty stable stock market. We had a slight um, tech crash in 2018. 2019 was a good year. Um, but passive funds have risen quite a lot. Sorry. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that that we can get into in subsequent questions. But a lot of it's just down to the technology being there, basically. Um, and it just being a preferred investment uh, strategy and what the market has demanded. Last but not least, people, uh, people get very confused about this, and I completely understand why. I remember being confused about it as well. It's almost like there's two different types of investing, right? There's kind of the more investing type, and then there's a the more trading type, and people kind of get confused. Both are very good strategies. Both make a lot of people money. I mean, which one you pick kind of determine, kind of depends on what kind of person you are, how much time you want to dedicate to this and where your skill set lies. Um, but fundamental, that's analyzing the underlying business of a stock. Uh, it often looks like this, where you kind of have your balance sheet and you're looking at kind of where the business model is at and you're looking at numbers and shit. And it's usually more of a long-term strategy. However, technical is much more short-term and it's much more behavioral. It's looking at the psychology of the traders. It's looking at the graphs. 
trying to work out pricing patterns, trying to predict where that line is going to go for next. You've got much less investment in the underlying instrument behind that price, and you've got much more investment in the actual graph. Uh, so that is that. Um, yeah, so we'll wrap up for a big question session in a minute. But in conclusion, we've gone through my top three reasons for why investing is an incredible skill set to learn and the incredible opportunities that it can provide you in today's society. We discussed what kind of person makes a good investor and how much money you need to get started. Uh, the test was Myers-Briggs, if you fancy doing it. Um, and we've also been through different asset classes and how they each generate a return, uh, in addition to hopefully breaking down a lot of that financial jargon. Um, so what's to come? That's largely up to you guys. Please let us know. Uh, David, I, and the rest of the team would love a load of feedback on this session. Uh, we've got things like financial ratios and how to actually set up an investment account, evaluating different brokerages in the pipeline, as well as many more ideas. Um, and a lot of these sessions will be kind of a deep dive on the basics covered here. This was designed to, one, get you motivated, and two, give everybody a general overview. Um, yeah, so thank you very much to David and the team. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an incredible ride with the Investment Society. And... We've done very well, absolutely incredible. And, and that doesn't come without strong leadership. And I know most of the committee on InvestSoc very, very well. Um, and yeah, they're a great bunch. They, they've honestly, they put the heart and soul into this society. Um, and it's great. It's absolutely great. So I've been Henry Gordon Roberts. Feel free to get in touch. That's the avatar you need to look out for on social media if you can't find my profile. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening, guys. And it, yeah, it's been a really, really good session. Uh, let's open up the floor to any questions. I'll go back to David for now. Uh, and right. then we'll do the Q&A. Henry, um, just before everyone leaves, um, thank you so much. I'm sorry we ran over everyone by a bit of time, but I hope that it was, it was useful, it was insightful. I certainly thought that it was great. And Henry, you're an incredible, engaging speaker. Um, and I still learn a lot, you know, I have quite a good investing knowledge and this, this, you know, there's so much detail to it to get into an hour. Um, so thank you. Um, we'll open up to questions. If anyone has, feel free to go. But before you do, um, the Investment Society literally has two or three events a week. Um, we have a blog as well, as I mentioned at the beginning, which we post three times a week. The link is in the chat. Uh, make sure to come to our events this week. We've got a great talk with Luke Jeeves from Bank of America. He's going to talk about his career, give a bit of a presentation, and then open up to your questions so you can learn about career in finance. Um, but definitely come along. We've also got a presentation tomorrow from the Mountbatten program, who are going to talk about uh, an internship opportunity in New York for 12 months, which from someone that's uh, actually worked abroad for six months, I can highly recommend. And I really, really think that you guys should be there if that's something that interests you. Um, so yeah, we're going to open up to questions. But again, I know it's late. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed and we hope to see you next time we do an investing one-on-one -on -one session. And if you have any feedback, any suggestions for future sessions, just let us know and we'll try and keep it to a, an hour max next time. But thank you. Much appreciated, guys. Any, any questions, please fire away. Just before anybody does go, if you want to take a break, that is very welcome. There'll probably be a few minutes of Q&A. We'll all take five before I go ahead and do a stock pitch and then we'll discuss news. Um, so just letting everyone know before they drop off. But yeah, uh, let's open it up to questions now. All right, we've had, we've had quite a lot in the chat and I know people have raised their hand. So um, I'm just going to go to Zara's question, which is as a beginner, what will be our next steps um, after this session? The next steps are come to our future sessions without a doubt. Um, you know, we're just going to go deeper and deeper into finance and investing and hopefully you'll learn more and more the, the more sessions you attend. Um, any books for a beginner with not much knowledge on investing? Oh, OK. Oh, fuck me. Uh, I've read hundreds of books. Um, Okay, yeah, let's actually, let's actually throw this out there um, and kind of give you guys a general overview. I would recommend the very first book that people read. It goes back to what I said in the chat about motivation. Look at that. Look what is on my desk. That is incredible. Look at that. Can everyone see that? This is, this is the book I'd recommend is the very first one. It's called The Big Secret for the Small Investor. Um, the reason I recommend this book above anything else is it will give you the motivation to get this stuff done for yourself. This guy, Joel Greenblatt, he was a very professional fund manager, a very, very talented guy. And he basically highlights why individual investors should go for it. 
um, you know, some of the disadvantages facing the professional industry and why as someone who's dedicated and intelligent, uh, why there's a lot of advantages for the individual investor over other people. In terms of a more comprehensive reading list, I could definitely give you a million. Um, I, I should probably work with David and compile one of those. Um, we'll but we'll put our reading list for sure, but just yeah. as another point to that, um, Ethan yeah. Diamond's actually put a, a small list in the chat as well, which is quite useful. Oh, Ethan's list. Ethan's list is very good. Um, yeah, don't get scared off by the intelligent investor. People will tell you it's a Bible. It's very useful. It's like having your grandfather sit you down on your knee and read your bedtime story. So don't get put off if it's a bit technical and a bit boring, but it's very informative. Um, yeah, it's a good list Ethan's got. Other things that aren't directly related, like prisons of geography just goes through geopolitics. Geopolitics links to commodities, right? Um, you know, even the list on there that, are, that isn't directly related to investing, it does link back in some format. Yeah, great. Um, I'll just see if we've got any other questions. We've got a couple of people raise their hands. So if you're happy, we've got um, Abdul Hassan, if you want to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question to either myself or Henry. All right, thank you. Uh, that was a good session. Um, I was just going to ask, do you guys uh, trade Forex or anything like that? Uh, I was wondering if we'd see any of that in the sessions. Interesting. Um, okay, so in, term, in terms of me, I have never, ever traded Forex purely from a Forex point of view. Uh, from my understanding, I think it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, let me just go back to here. I think it's a very difficult thing to do, particularly because you're trying to you're trying to predict as and when um, these outcomes are going to happen. To, to be fair, I, I actually I did run a virtual fund at Citibank where I did have to trade forex, but I've never done it for myself. Even that being said, I, I actually do have to do it because whenever I'm investing in a foreign stock, there's a currency position on that as well. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of my money is in the U.S. at the moment. Every time I buy U.S. shares there's a currency position on that, i.e. I'm long a dollar pound every time I invest in it. But I would say currency is very difficult. It's macroeconomic and it's technical, so it's not my area of expertise. Um, but yeah, I, I could run basics on it uh, and we could see if there's anybody who did have a very specific interest in it who wanted to run a session. Yeah, 100% that we're going to try and run some uh, alternative asset sessions as well, I think. And Forex is definitely up there. We've had a lot of interest in that um, in our WhatsApp group chats as well. So stay tuned um, for sure. Just see if we've got any other last questions. Oh, um, yeah, here we do have one. Actually, George has raised his hand if I can find him on. George, feel free to yeah, it's, it's me. Uh, so I'm going to be investing mostly in the US. Uh, would you recommend I get a foreign currency account because of this like discrepancy between the pound and the dollar? That's a good question. Um, I've got a foreign currency account. Um, I mean, okay, so yeah, that, that is a really good question, actually. Basically, what, what, yeah, okay, I would, yeah, I would recommend yes. I've never thought about that, but yes. Basically, because if you, if you, if you have cash as pounds in your account, I'm mean, have to trade the dollars every time, you have to think about the foreign exchange every time, right? With my US investment account, I, wait, I found a good entry point for the dollar, I waited until it was 130 or above uh, and then cashed in all my pounds at $130 um, or $1.3, I should say. Uh, and then that was it. Like, I don't have to worry about the foreign exchange until I actually take cash out of my US account, which I've actually never done because I just reinvest most of the profit. So I would say, yes, if you're going to invest a lot in foreign equities or if you're looking specifically at the US, I would say, yeah, probably get an account where you can wait for an op opportune time to transfer your money into US dollars and then you don't have to constantly worry about the Forex every time you're gonna buy a share. Yeah, so I'm an international student, so uh, my money's in US anyway, USD oh. anyway. So what's okay. happening is, is I'm converting it to pounds and I, I wouldn't want to convert it back to dollars after that. So yeah, I think-, I think Oh, I'll... right, yeah, I see. I mean, yeah, yeah, you'd rather, if you, yeah, you'd rather just, you just don't want to, if you're not experienced trading Forex, you just kind of want to minimize the amount of times you're exchanging it, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, so thank you. Question. All right, Henry, I think that is everything for this session. Um, thank yeah. you again. It was great. Thank you, all of you who are still here for coming, for waiting around, for letting us take up your evening. And we hope to see you 
again here from Investing One hopefully next week. Um, just follow five us. Five minutes. Up. Come in five minutes. Yeah, come to our room. Go for a pee. Uh, Get yourself a cup of tea. Come back. Exactly. And uh, it will be a bit more advanced, but it will just be a nice chat, chance for you guys to uh, chat with each other. Maybe we'll put you in breakout rooms as well, but we'll see. Um, yeah, stick around. Yeah. Follow us on social media and thank you again. Thank you, guys. Honestly, that is incredible. 93 participants. 90. 96, what was it? 98. 98, fuck me. And 73 still there. So 75% of people made it to the end through the Q&A. That is incredible. Thank you, guys. That means a lot. Exactly. Awesome. Right. Cheers, David. Henry. I'll see you in five minutes. I'll see you guys in five. And no pressure to stick around if you don't want either. It's not a compulsory. No, or or come for two minutes, see if what I'm talking about floats your boat, and then leave. Right, exactly. Yeah. Follow the blog, follow us on social media. Uh, see you there.